What's going on? This Wednesday, December 20th, the Magic Online Vintage Cube returns. Currently, there is a Vintage Cube. It's the Alpha Frog Vintage Cube, which is a variant guest Vintage Cube. Uh, I've been enjoying it because it is a Vintage Cube. But uh, this Wednesday, the Magic Online like holiday winter update cube has uh, is going to show up. And there's been a bunch of changes to it, as has been the trend recently with Daybreak Games and Ryan Spain pretty much in control of uh, the Vintage Cube. And uh, if you don't know Ryan, he was uh, he worked at Wizards for a long time. He was one of the founders of the Limited Resources podcast, along with Marshall Sutcliffe. He's definitely been entrenched in Magic and Cubing for a long time. So I, I've been a big fan of him being in charge of Magic Online. I think he is one of the best people uh, to put in charge of it. I think his, his, his heart is where it needs to be when it comes to Magic Online. And uh, I want to go over these changes today. So um, we have the Magic Online Vintage 2023 Winter Update. I, I, I left out Cube in that sense, and that's okay. Uh, my name is Chris Wolf. Some of you might recognize me for my involvement in the design of the last two updates to this Cube. Those iterations were so well received that MTGO's creative director, Ryan Spain, trusted me to craft this iteration of the Cube, cube largely as I saw fit, provided... It fit his vision for the future of the Vintage Cube. Uh, as it happens, I love Ryan's vision. I was excited to build the first card list for the Cube with the concept of rotating archetype packages in mind. This is something they talked about previously. Um, yeah, you can you can you can go to the Magic uh, MTGO.com and, and read the article for yourself. It's actually pretty insightful, and I, I do like a lot of the the things they're implementing because it gives you a chance to try out a lot of stuff. Um, do you miss casting Muldrift or Consecrated Sphinx? Yes. Uh, are you worried you'll never get to take the initiative again? Mm. Do you want old classics like Smokestack back? Mm, no. We're getting worse and worse as we go for me. We can bring all those favorites back and more over time with an increase in Vintage Cube availability. Yes to that. And a deliberate package rotation system. And we can do it without disrupting the core powered Vintage Cube experience. With all that in mind, what did I do with this winter update? At a high level, I reduced the number of white cards by a fair amount. That's interesting. They are the least sought after. And because there are lots of functional analogs among them, I could reduce... There are a lot of functional analogs among them. I could reduce the quantity of white cards without damage and the, the integrity of the archetype. I hope that's true. There's also a boost to the robots artifact creature uh, archetype in this iteration, which white can usually branch into seamlessly. That feels correct. Uh, I don't know if the implementation is correct, but that statement does feel correct. Like, you can usually just mix white and artifact, and you're getting a very, very similar... Uh, play experience. I added another 10 dual lands, both to support the incoming lands archetype and because the ability for players to cast their spells is so vital to producing fun, interactive magic games. I agree with that completely. I removed more narrow or underperforming classics and used the extra space to execute on this archetype package rotation plan. This is one of the reasons I don't have twin, or not twin, <laughs> you could say I'm, I'm reading ahead a little bit, uh, Storm in my cube. Cards like Manamorphose, Cabal Ritual, Desperate Ritual, Pyretic Ritual, like, all of these cards are basically blanks unless you're drafting Storm. I like having a lot of versatility and overlap in my cards. So, like, if a card can't go into, like, two archetypes at least, it just feels like it's just taking up space. And I think Storm is one of the largest uh, offenders of this because most of their cards are basically just... They're, they're kind of do-nothings until you do something, right? Like, I'm going to play 14 do-nothing cards. Mishra's Bobble, Gataxian Probe. Like, all these cards do nothing. And I, I can see the value of cards like Probe and, and Bobble more so than I can um, cards like Desperate Ritual, which only adds one mana. Um, so, yeah, that's that's my philosophy as well. Uh, whereas, like, I want, I want these cards that um, do more, basically. So, out is twin very interesting but i also don't hate it again like like i was just saying you're rarely playing triple red kiki jiki in a deck that doesn't have pestermite or deceiver x arc and even when i'm like a blue white tempo deck i'm just not putting deceiver x arc in my deck if i have it without one of the combo pieces i i don't know if i i think splinter twin is iconic enough and it takes up so few slots that it could be fine but i, I don't really mind it Rotating out is the iconic Splinter Twin Kiki Jiki combo is a great example of the kinds of historically unmovable archetypes we are willing to bench in the pursuit of fun and variety. Many 
of the parts of this combo are narrow and don't contribute to other major strategies in this cube. So when it returns, we will look to bring it back with other strategies to make the weaker cards in the package uh, less one note. That makes sense. I'm gonna go slowly so we can actually... This makes me sad. <laughs> I was skeptical about Dream Halls and then I ended up loving it. And it was my favorite archetype toward the end of the last like cube release. I don't even want to call them seasons anymore because it's like they're not really seasons. They're just like every every other month there's a vintage cube up, which I've been absolutely thrilled with. We're also letting go of the Dream Halls package for now. It was a fun ride that we'll definitely bring back, but it is time to mix things up. I don't know, man. This is just four cards that like they're super fun. I I, I really enjoyed them. I mean, nothing I say is going to change this, of course, <laughs> but I'm just saying like this was a great addition and I really really enjoyed it way more than I thought I would. Bringing Doomsday in. That's fascinating to me. All right, so what's new? We've brought Doomsday into the mix along with Thassa's Oracle and Jace, Wilder of Mysteries. So here's the funny thing. I actually had Thassa's Oracle, Jace, Wilder of Mysteries, and Laboratory Maniac in my own vintage cube. There was a self, in lieu of Storm, um, I had a self mill component. So I also had brainstorm. So you could basically brainstorm yourself, play Thassa's Oracle, Jace Wilder of Mysteries. One of these cards that like lets you win the game when you have no cards in your library. So I definitely had a way for you to play a lot of spells and then play a storm card and then win through that, through that means. So Doomsday is kind of similar, except they're just, they're just cutting out the middleman and putting Doomsday in, which is troll black. I don't know if this is going to be as as powerful or like as consistent as they think it is, but we'll see. Along with Asus Oracle and Jace Wilder Mysteries to have some straightforward empty library wins, but you can always just go ahead and put together whatever combo you want to finish off your opponents after resolving Doomsday. That's true. I think Doomsday is a very, very interesting card. I think it's very versatile. It's got, it does a lot of things. Um, there's a lot of combos you can piece together with it. And it's a very high skill level card for sure. It's high risk, high reward. So, okay, this is a lot. <laughs> Apparently they're buffing the land archetype, which is, which is, I don't know if I agree with it because it was already one of the most popular sought after archetypes in the cube. So like making it so that multiple people are going to be playing this land archetype per draft is, I don't know if it's good. It was the breakout edition for sure. Yep. Yeah. People playing Titania and Candelabra and Zurin Orb. It's just like, it was very fun and it was, it was very popular. We've been moving in this direction already with the recent additions like Titania, Zurin Orb, and Sylvan Safekeeper. Okay, sure. Uh, joining the pre-existing Dark Depths and Strip Mine combos, but this lands package brings a whole new approach. The additions of Scape Shift with Valak at the Mountain Pinnacle and Dryad of the Lysian Grove or Prismatic Omen turning everything into mountains offers classic Valak at Kill, but there's more. What more is there? Oh, are we bringing in Bounce Lands? That's pretty cool. Green gets Bounce Lands. Oh, just green. Interesting. Like Simith Grove Chamber to combine with Fast Spawn and other effects to generate additional land plays, such as the returning Dryad of the Elysian Grove. Uh, and the first time edition, Sakura Tribe Scout and Arboreal Grazer. That seems like so many slots for like such redundancy. Like it's just like five cards that let you play one extra land each turn. And I assume they're not taking out Explorer. Like uh, so many, it's so much redundancy. Uh... Repeatedly bounce around bounce lands to generate as many landfall triggers as your game state allows, then pick your payoff. Valakut, Valakut Molten, Mol Valakut the Molten Pinnacle, Valakut Exploration, Hedron Crab, Lotus Cobra, and Field of the Dead can produce wins on the spot, or a huge resource influx you can convert into a win. Spelunking is another new addition to turbocharge the archetype by imitating Amulet of Vigor's rules text, but on a card that isn't as narrow in function. Yeah, Amulet of Vigor is not a great cube card because it does nothing. <laughs> Whereas Spelunking at least lets you ramp, right? You put a land in a, into play, uh, you draw a card, you gain life. Like, it, it does a lot. It's basically a three-mana ramp card that also just stays on board and lets your lands under untapped, which is pretty good. Um, with the bounce lands giving... Oh, we, we saw ahead a little bit. Giving green four extra dual lands to the other colors getting one. I filled out the rest of a ten-card dual land cycle with six additional dual lands, giving one to each guild. Doomsday and its tough mana requirements requirements also benefit from this breaking sunken ruins and the that's actually pretty good i've never done it myself because i think it's it's it can be kind of complicated and tricky but i like customizing the dual lands to what the archetypes want right so like if you have triple black and triple blue cards like cryptic command or doomsday or beseech the mirror put in sunken ruins which generates two black for you 
and it makes those cards a little bit easier to cast whereas like other colors may not need the filter lands so i guess we're bringing in thopter thopter Thopter, Foundry, and sort of the Meek here. That's fascinating. To make some room for the extra lands, I removed some of the Talismans. Oh, interesting. Leaving the blue Jeskai versions. The colors that want these rocks the most. Jeskai artifacts also get a new combo. That's the other thing. Like, I'm such a rigid thinker that, like, it's weird to me to have, like, six Talismans instead of all ten. And just, like, take out the green ones or take out the black ones. Like, I don't know. That seems weird to me. It feels... It feels incomplete, and I like my brain doesn't work well with that kind of asymmetry, I think. Um, Jeskai Artifacts also gets a new combo with Thopter Foundry and Sword of the Meek, which has a lot of additional support cards, such as Goblin Engineer, Kappa, Kappa Cannoneer, and Staff of the Storyteller. Oh, we're adding Kappa Cannoneer. That's interesting. The introduction of Thopter Sword uh, opened a door for the return of Tezzeret. Uh, the ability to tutor for the Thopter combo and untap the One Ring gives Tezzeret enough to do to warrant a return. I actually, yeah... I agree with that. I think Tef I think Tezzeret's super cool. Warriors. Domain Warriors, to be specific. Green went through the biggest identity shift with a green-red domain package entering the mix in addition to the green heavy lands package. The tri-lands have already given the cube a head start on the domain archetype, but one of the more appealing payoffs for domain is Nahila, the Blade Blossom, uh, which you did not put up here. <laughs> that's, that's interesting. Okay, let's go look it up. Uh, okay, so 3-2 for 3. Whenever a warrior attacks, you may have its controller create a 1-1 one, one that's also tapped and attacking. Untap all attacking creatures. They gain trample, lifelink, and haste, and then you get an additional combat step. Yeah, that's that's really good if you're playing domain, for sure. Yeah, that's wild. Okay. I would have recommended putting it in, in, your, in your little showcase here. Uh who asks for warriors around her to be truly great. Fortunately, many of the most powerful domain creatures are warriors, namely Rodas Firebrand, Walna Cattle, and Neshoba Brawler. Territorial Kavu isn't a warrior, which is weird. Uh, no, it's not weird. That makes sense. But two mana five power creatures are still bangers, especially when you strap an Ember Cleave onto them and finish your opponents off with Tribal Flames to the Dome. That seems like it's going to be fun archetypes to play against. Okay. That covers the major archetype shifts. We can move on to individual cards, but for now... But before we do, I wanted to thank Ryan and the whole Daybreak Online team for their continuous efforts in improving this experience for everyone. Agree wholeheartedly. Um, I've had several conversations with Ryan since they've taken over, uh, even, like, you know, every recently. And I, the the passion and the commitment they, they have towards Magic Online is just extremely uh, reassuring and appreciated. So, Ryan, Tony... Daybreak guys, appreciate you. Uh, it was Ryan who first approached me and sought my involvement with the Magic Online Vintage Cube, a move that exemplifies the team's clear ethos of caring for and about the community and valuing their feedback. I want to do my best to carry that spirit forward, so don't be shy about reaching out. You can find me on Twitter and the Cube section of the MTGO Discord, but feel free to direct me towards other places that have engaging discussions about all things Vintage Cube as well. Um, okay, so this is the complete change list. Adanto Vanguard out, Seasoned Hollow Blade in. I so I haven't played with a Seasoned Hollow Blade S card for a while. Instead, I've been playing Guardian of New Benalia, which is, I just think is a straight upgrade. This is a 2 2 for 2 instead of a 3 1 for 2, but it still has the same discard to make an indestructible effect. It also scries whenever it enlists a creature, and you can enlist a creature. So, like, I just feel like this is a significantly better version of Seasoned Hollow Blade. Discard a card, tap it, and it gains a destructible. Discard a card, tap it, and it gains a destructible. It's the same ability, except it has two other abilities as well. Um, and I think if you're playing a Vintage Cube, which is, you know, meant to be more powerful, like, I, I think the one toughness, or the one power is kind of negligible, especially because you can enlist and add more. Like, you can make this a 4-2. A you know? I don't know. I, I, I think that... I think this is a better card, uh, Guardian. Hollowblade is a bit worse offensively and a bit better defensively, but most importantly, a warrior. Oh, it's I guess you want the warrior? And she's a soldier? Okay, sure. Uh, powerful two-mana creatures are plentiful for magic, making it a great... Yeah, you know what? I That's fine. I'll read these now instead of uh, bemoaning the decision. Armageddon out. 
Restless Bivouac in. This is an interesting, this should not be one for one. <laughs> I feel like the functional Armageddon reprint left the cube last time and the OG follows it out this time as the effect is too weak against many archetypes. To, I agree with that. It's There's very few scenarios where casting Armageddon is either beneficial for you or doesn't backfire for you. Swapping out sideboard land destruction to make room for another cycle of main deck, main deckable fixing is a net fun increase. I mean, I just think all of these lands should be in here. I think these creature lands are all really good. They're well costed. They're versatile. Boonbringer, I, I was never a huge fan. Sky Sovereign, I don't know how I feel about that guy either. Boonbringer is powerful, fun, and likely to return someday, but we wanted to reduce White's card count, and some cards had to give. Sky Sovereign's colorless repeatable removal has become well positioned in a vintage cube landscape with fewer creatureless decks and is a nice addition to decks in a lot of archetypes. I don't disagree with any of that. Elesh Norn coming out feels really rough. I don't love it. For Nettlesist, uh, what is this? Plus one, plus one for each artifact or enchantment you control. If this is supported, I think it's kind of cute. Lesh known as an iconic cube card, but one of them that is finding fewer and fewer homes in decks. And Nettlesis, on the other hand, looks... See, this is the interesting thing. Uh, finding fewer homes in the cube is like... The cube is such a living, organic thing that you really have to evaluate everything when you're rebuilding it or, or adding and removing cards. Like... I also have this visceral, visceral gut reaction to taking Lesh Norn and Grand Cenobite out because it feels bad. But on the other hand, like... Maybe it is correct. Like that, it's not, this This explanation is reasonable and I, I kind of agree with it. Like if if like a Lush Norn is constantly tabling and people aren't picking it excitedly, then it just doesn't have many homes. And so why wouldn't you put a card that is more exciting and more versatile in that more people will be clamoring for? Like that just makes sense. That makes for a better play experience. Like making things, putting game pieces in the game that more people are excited about and excited to play with, just it just makes sense. Uh, holds a lot of promise in both the workshop and robots. Oh, yeah, if you can go turn one Misha's workshop into Nettlesis, like that's very interesting. Elspeth's son's champion. I, I love this card too. I'm going to have these, I'm going to have visceral reactions, I think. But then I'm going to be like, mm, okay, maybe. Uh, Heart of Kieran, 4-4. Four, four, yeah, we know what Heart of Kieran does. I don't know if you guys do, but I'll just leave this up for a second. You can check it out. Uh, as, a, as the tr traditional control model declines in effectiveness, that's sad. So do its top end cards like Big uh, Ellie. Heart of Kieran does more than it may seem, providing an aerial beater for aggressive decks and a surprising, surprisingly effective Planeswalker Protector. Um, yes. This is another card that, like, if the archetypes support it, if you have a Planeswalker archetype, um, and I and I, if they do, I hope to see Karth the Lion in the cube because that guy's super sweet and fairly fun to build around. Ephemerate out. That's fine. I think Ephemerate's actually kind of narrow. For Samwise the Stouthearted. I think this is fine. I'm not a huge Samwise the Stouthearted fan in the cube. I played with it a bit in the Alpha Frog cube. And I think it's just kind of a little too difficult to engineer a situation where you actually... Like, to set this up, it's kind of tricky. And additionally, I'm not a huge fan of cards where the ring tempts you once. Because it makes for kind of an awkward situation where like, cool, the ring tempted me. Now I have to keep track of it the whole game, even though no other cards in my deck tempt me. So I will never advance. And if the ring bearer dies, then it doesn't matter anymore, but I still want to keep track of it for the game state. It makes for like a kind of a complicated game scenario. Like that's why I like Call of the Ring because it itself it self replicates the the ring tempting you. It just keeps tempting you, so it's your outlet to make the ring tempting you matter. Whereas Samwise just does it once and then you know it's done. While Ephemerate can feel ridiculous with powerful evoke creatures, it's hard to generate a game breaking interaction consistently. It's a fun effect to include sometimes. It doesn't warrant mainstay. It's there's times where you have Ephemerate and you're like this does nothing. Uh, it doesn't warrant mainstay status. Meanwhile, Samwise is a more consistent performer that also works nicely with the, the elementals, but also. With strip mine, fetch lands, and other sacrifice for value permits. Yeah, there's nothing I want to do more than buy back a strip mine. Iona out. I agree with this. This is a card that's literally never been cast. It's only reanimated. And I don't want it in my reanimate decks as much as I want, like, Archon of Cruelty. So Patchwork Automaton comes in, which is probably one of the robots they like. 
Whenever you cast an artifact, put a 1-1 counter on this guy, and it has Ward 2. Similarly to Leshnorn, Iona is arguably an all-time Vintage Cube classic, but it's also inarguably past her prime in the modern meta. Patchwork Automaton, which you've been eyeing since it was printed, slips nicely into the meta, getting out of hand quickly in dedicated robots decks, and filling the curve for aggressive decks with a decent artifact count. Yeah, okay. Karmic Guide comes out, which I think is fine. Five mana for Karmic Guide's effect is just doesn't hold up. Timeless Dragon is fine. I also think they're like kind of leaning on this the, the planes, the basic land type cycling cards because they've been very popular. But I think two mana is a little bit harder than one mana. Still, putting this guy in the graveyard, getting a land, and then eternalizing it on four is really good. Dual land fetching cyclers have been performing well. Okay, yeah. So we'll add one for white that also works nicely with Staff of the Storyteller. Yeah, and if it's either it's either Timeless Dragon or Eagles of the North. And despite the one mana cycling difference, I think Timeless Dragon is just significantly better. Uh, so we'll add one white that also works nicely with Staff of the Storyteller and a Seeker's Chariot. That's true because you get to either populate the dragon token or you get to uh, draw a card, Mega, add a counter to the, to the Staff of the Storyteller. We pulled the serviceable but clunky Karmic Duty, Karmic Guide, Karmic Duty, Karmic Guide for it, and we'll consider bringing it back later for a more synergistic appearance, sure. Relic Order is also just kind of meh. Um, I've never really liked Relic Order. Portable Hole's fine. Can still hang on power level with the double white cost restricts the decks that can run it. 100% agree. I think double white for a 2-2 that has this effect is just not super impressive. Uh, Portable Hole performs the role of early game Mana Rock Killer while adding another artifact to support the multitude of decks looking for that synergy. Yeah, this only hits things with mana value 2 or less, so it's it's kind of restricted, but it costs 1 mana. So, Recruiter for Ranger. I, I'm i not a Recruiter fan, and I know a lot of people love Recruiter of the Guard. I think that when you're paying 3 mana for a 1-1, one, one, it just feels bad. Um... I think so many people are like, you can't pay four mana for Jace because it just doesn't do anything. on. I'm like, Recruiter is even less, and it costs three. Like, I don't know. Like, I think the same argument that people are making for for cards that do more, they don't make for Recruiter. So I'm, I'm totally fine with this change. Recruiter is a great vintage cube card. It's just taking a breather to support some variety. The Captain is a worse Recruiter, but it has the added bonus of mucking with your opponent's non-creature plans, becoming a three mana Platinum Angel against non-creature combo strategies like Storm, and sometimes locking them out completely with Guardian Scale Lord. Yeah, I mean, I like this card. I think it's good. Resto is out for Archangel Avacyn. No real opinion on this. I think both are fine. I think Resto's seeing less and less play recently. Since the twin combo and a lot of the Blink support is rotating out this iteration, we'll send the Blink Angel to the bench with them and bring back a different flashy Angel for White's top end. Sure. I didn't even know Spectral Precision was in. Uh, it's not high, It's not coming up here. Oh, there it is. Um, wedding announcement's fine. I think this is a good update. I think this is a solid. Uh, wedding announcement's interesting because it can be looked at as a token maker, but it can also be looked at as an anthem effect. And the fact that it does both of those things is super nice because you can take out a card like Spectral Procession that only does one for this card that takes on like, it's like an honor of the pure and raise the alarm in one. Another move away from cards pointing towards monocolored decks, but unlike some other cuts, Spectral Procession was overdue for a cut on power level. 100%. I don't know why it was still in there. Compare what it offers against the flexibility and overall value proposition of Wedding Announcement. It's a turn over turn value group of modern cards like this that has pushed a lot of beloved classics out of Vintage Cube on power level. Yes. Student of Warfare out, Kithian in. I agree with this as well. I've seen student being played recently and every time someone plays a student against me, I kind of pump the fist because I'm like, you're going to invest six mana in this fucking thing. Oops, sorry. <laughs> and then I'm just going to kill it with a fail push. Like, you invest so much mana into Student of Warfare, and then it just gets killed. Whereas Kithian is like, it's just a 2-1 one for 1, it flips into a Planeswalker, it can get indestructible. Student is a mono-white only cut, not a power level cut. Kithian is a house in aggressive decks, and while he will often end up in mono-white decks, that was the Student of Warfare's only home. While Boros acquiring cards recently that incentivize two-color aggro, with Boros acquiring cards that incentivize two-color aggro, we want to offer more flexibility in white's early drops, sure. Sun Titan out for Shadow Spear. Okay. Shadow Spear has become a staple in constructed decks for its ability to work around some pesky mechanics while keeping aggro in check. Well known from, from constructed decks. This is, this is an interesting sentence and I feel like they missed something here because there's two spaces here. So it looks like there should have been a word right here. 
it's well known from constructed that is well known from constructed decks maybe now you can do that in cube yeah i, I think this is this was probably missed in editing Tithe Taker out for Luminarch Aspirant. I have both of these in my queue. I think Luminarch Aspirant's just fantastic if you want to facilitate any sort of white strategy. Probably come and go in the in the two slot for a while for white. Tithe Taker will probably come and go in the two slot for white, but it's time for one of the premier white two mana creatures to shine. Luminarch Aspirant might be good enough if it could only target its if it can only target itself, but the ability to toss a counter onto that one drop and attack for three and spread value around the board puts it way over the top. Yeah, that's also why they nerfed it in in Alchemy in uh, Magic Online, so or uh, at Magic Arena, rather. So, Wall of Omens out, Staff of the Storyteller in. I don't think this is wrong. I just kind of like Wall of Omens, but, you know, some, sometimes I read these and I'm like, maybe that's correct. Maybe it's just take out Wall of Omens time. How many times are people playing it? I want, I want to put cards in the cube that people are excited to play and that they feel like this card is leading me to my other strategies and synergies, right? So Wall of Omens, you play it and you're like, okay, I drew a card, it's cool. So after the Storyteller, I get to feel like, okay, I'm also drawing a card, but, you know, I get to draw more cards later, it's making a token. It's This is basically a 1-1 one, one flyer, and this is basically a 0-4, and they both draw you a card, but this has the potential to draw you more cards. It counts for artifacts. Wall of Omen should be have seen this coming. Staff of the Storyteller in a vacuum is reasonable if unexciting value play, but build around it even a little bit and you can be drawing extra card a turn for one mana. With creature tokens around throughout the cube, it's hard not to build around it a little bit. It also provides further support for the artifacts matter archetypes in the cube. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I said. Brawl out, which is great because the only decks that were playing Brawl were Storm. Hedron Crab in, I, I don't know. I don't know about Hedron Crabs. Hedron Crab is a crucial combo piece for the lands archetype rotating in. With many ways to generate extra land drops in the queue, the crab can get out of hand quickly, even allowing for turn one kills when combined with fast spawn and a bounce land. Boy, that sounds fun. You can also combine this with Scape Shift for a combo killer and mill yourself for value. No, don't like that. Consider is out for Thought Scour. No, don't like that. What do you consider to be worst blue cantrip in the queue? The worst blue cantrip. You can see our vote with this swap, which we will switch to one that digs one card deeper for Doomsday Kills, adds one more card for Graveyard Shenanigans, and instantly hoses top deck tutors like Vampiric Tutor. I mean, that, sure, but that's overlooking the, the selection with consider, right? Like, I get to look at the top card and figure if I want it in the graveyard. I'm just not automatically putting it in the graveyard. It's the same thing with Preordain, right? Like... If preordain was look at two cards, automatically put them on the bottom of your library, and then draw a card, it's not. It's not. That's not the same card, right? You're 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 kind of kind of ignoring the uh, the fact that you get to choose whether you want to put the card in the graveyard. Thought Scour just puts them in the graveyard. You're just drawing a random card here. Where here you're getting selection like opt. Deceiver Exarch is out. Hope. Okay, this one I completely disagree with. I think Hallbreacher makes for absolutely miserable miserable games. Uh, Exarch rotates out with Splinter Twin, creating room for Hallbreacher. We have seen bolstering. We have, I, I assume this is meant to be seen. Bolsterings. We, oh, no, maybe it is. We have been bolstering support for draw seven strategies. So having a foil for them makes sense. There are, yeah, but that's not how that works. This is not a foil for the seven mana, the draw seven strategies. The people who are playing the draw seven cards are just playing Hallbreacher. That's not how that works at all. There are fun factor concerns to keep an eye on, but blue could use the power boost. Not a blue could use the power boost. Not a comment you would have heard about Vintage Cube in the past or currently. Dream Hall's out. Show and tell in. I don't know. Okay. Dream Hall's was a very successful experiment that captured a lot of hearts, but it's a perfect example of a kind of card that necessitates enough specific narrow support to include that it shouldn't appear every time. Show and Tell remains a bit of a trap in the league setting where you play out of a pod, but with 64 player events providing in pod play and the intel on the, viable, the viability of the strategy that comes with it, this one deserves to be brought back. Mm, I don't think so, but okay. Factor Fiction out. I, I kind of agree with this. I think Factor Fiction is has been too slow for a little while now. Lose focus in. Counterspell unless the controller pays two, and then you can replicate it. So it's a... Yeah, I'm not going to make comparisons here. Factor Fiction still produces a fun and interesting minigame. It's mostly too slow these days. 
right? Two mana counter anything spells with a single blue and the cost that scale with the game are generally worthy of vintage cubes. So let's give lose focus a shot. Being able to target different spells is a nice bonus. Hallbreaker Horror is out. That's fine. This guy costs seven mana. It's you're only hard casting it. It's just not super exciting. For a Psy, which is much more synergistic with other cards, let's say. Hallbreaker Horror is a neat combo finisher card and likely to return, but gives way here for Psy. Psy powers up the robot's archetype, offers a sacrifice outlet for the one ring and coveted jewel, and also plays nicely with Sword of the Meek. Sure, that's fine. Opposition out. Tezzeret the Seeker, and I agree with this. I think Opposition's kind of unfun. I took I took it out of my cube a little while ago. Like, Opposition's a card that locks down the game so you can't actually win against it, but it doesn't win you the game. So you just, it's like Storm in a sense that like, you're dead, but you're not going to know for like 15 more minutes, and that's just not fun. Opposition is among the trusty old friends no longer carrying their weight that, we've let, they're letting, that we're letting go of as mainstays in the Vintage Cube, Tezzeret was previously cut for that same reason, but this gives us an example of the kind of context which, where such cards will return. Tutoring for your Thopter Founds, your Sword of the Meat combo piece, and untapping the One Ring provided some additional synergy and utility that weren't in the cube last time Tezzeret was. Pestermite out, True Name in, this seems fine. Pestermite leaves with the Kiki Twin package. True Name was cut from the cube a long time ago for being fairly obnoxious and pretty broken. I agree, so was Hellbreacher. Uh... While we still, while it will still generate some frustrating game states for opponents, we don't think it will qualify as broken, just good. And blue could use the power boost. At least if you were in a dire spot against True Name, it will be over quickly and you'll have a good comeback story. Or you'll have a good comeback story. Phantasmal out for Thassa's Oracle. Mm, that's fine. A card that was previously cut due to not having enough support is now rotating in with the Doomsday Package. In addition to that combo win potential, you can also just mill yourself out and get it back with Savine's Reclamation. I do like Savine's Reclamation. I think I also have it in my cube. Um, it's just like Sun Titan Light. Also, the backside of Burgie God of Storytelling also quickly... And with the backside of Burgie's God of Storytelling also quickly allows you to churn through your deck. There are lots of new toys for Thassa's Oracle to play with in this iteration. Sure. Sower is out for Jace, that's fine. Sower's relative power level has waned as an extremely killable four drop while Jace provides some redundancy for the Doomsday combo. Stowaway out. I mean, I added Malcolm Alluring Scoundrel, but I took out Fairy Mastermind because I think I think Stowaway is one of the best looters that you can get. Um, Stowaway is still good, but the flash of Malcolm gives an edge we want to try out. Sure, but I mean, I think it's... Stowaway is one of the stronger looters. Uh, Svyellen is out for Unctus. Unctus might not seem great on first read, but the card does a lot. I also have Unctus in my my cube maybe board, so it's definitely a card I also consider. Turn all your blue creatures into looters, your looters into double looters, and your artifact looters into real threats. It can also enable all of, all of its statics with its own activated ability. Yeah, so Unctus says other blue creatures have, whenever this creature becomes tapped, draw a card, then discard. Other artifact creatures you control get plus one, plus one. And until the end of turn, target creature you control becomes a blue artifact in addition to its other colors and types activate only as a sorcery. So it does a lot, and it's a 2-4 for 3. Like, it's a very interesting card. Thirst is out. Intuition is in. Intuition is just an interesting card to try and cook with. So for all the head chefs out there, post your best and most creative piles on the MTG Cube Discord. MTGO Cube Discord, sure. Torrential Gearhook out makes me sad. Um, this this card is just my one of my favorites. Kappa Cannoneer is in. It's a 4-4 four, for four, 5. It's got a 6 with Improvise and Ward 4. Whenever an artifact enters the battlefield, it gets counter. Can't be blocked. It's kind of obnoxious. It's very good. With the departure of Magma Opus in the Dream Halls package, Torrential Gearhook loses some oomph and goes and goes with them. Kappa Cannoneer should be a potent addition with all the artifact token generators available. Yeah, I agree. It's going to be too good. <laughs> this card, uh, yeah, this is this is a card we're all going to get our asses kicked by at some point. Like, it's just impossible to deal with. Ward 4 is just not a reasonable amount of ward. Treasure Cruise out, Gush in. The big delve spells have always been pretty hard to enable. I agree completely. I don't actually like Treasure Cruise. I, it's not in my cube. I have Dig Through Time. Maybe? I don't even think I have it. I think I took it out for Memory Deluge because I just think it's, it is very hard to get, like, a reasonable number of cards in your graveyard that you actually want to exile. 
So we feel that at least one of them can give way to package support. Gush is a key for the Doomsday combo while also working nicely with the new lands archetype and with Storm as always. Great. Make sure you never take out Storm. Venser Shaper Savant is out for Aether Spellbomb. Venser's not completely outclassed, but also not in its prime anymore. Aether Spellbomb is a nice addition with a heavy push toward artifacts in this iteration. Just having cheap artifact spells is always good value and when combined with Emery, Lurker of the Lock, or Tamishi, Reality Architect, can really stop your opponents in their tracks. One thing I don't like is that it feels like we're taking out, like, four mana cards for one mana cards. Like, Gear Hulk into Cannoneer. Cannoneer is going to be cheap. Venser into Aether Spellbomb, which costs one. Uh, Soar into Jace's. I guess that's a even cost. I don't know. Yeah, like, I don't know. Maybe I'm, Maybe not. Bizarre is out, which is great. I don't, I'm not a big fan of, fan of Bizarre myself. Into Currency Converter. I'd like to say Bizarre for future iteration with better support for it. It's such a powerful and iconic card and doesn't have a home currently outside of straight combo reanimator. Currency Converter is just a great cubable card with a whole host of applications outside of being a neat little value engine on its own. I mean, I think I think Currency Converter is just great. So, yeah, so not really going to complain about that one. I think Currency Converter is also good because you can get it with Urza Saga. Considering how long this change list is, I'm going to call this here at, at about 36 minutes. Tomorrow, I'm going to go over the black, red, green, and multicolor cards that have changed for the Vintage Cube. So definitely make sure to check that one out as well. This one's going up uh, today, Monday, December 18th. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this. Let me know what you guys think about the changes that we've seen so far, and tomorrow we'll go over the rest uh, for the other colors that they're, that they're replacing with. Thank you guys for watching. Slam those like and subscribe buttons. I'll see you next time.